directly related to secondhand smoke exposure, the best thing that we can do is to establish a smoke free policy. So why would we establish a policy? How do we get from A to B? Well, the first thing is we know all of those impacts of tobacco, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke, and we know that where people live, where they spend most of their time is where they're going to be exposed to most of these contaminants. So not only is it just ethically and morally a good thing to do, but it's also really good for owners. So when you think about the economic impacts, right off the top, many insurance companies, they actually offer a discount for developers who have 100% smoke-free policies. So you can ask your individual insurance, see whether or not they offer something, but more, more likely than not, they do. And it also reduces turnover costs to have a smoke-free policy in place. So we know that it can be two to, two to seven times more expensive to turn over a unit it after there's a smoker that has been living in it. And we all have heard about the fires and the burns and the cleanup costs that have come with smokers. But let's talk a little bit about more fires. So people who are smoking in their units are more likely to cause fires. And we know that smoking is actually the leading cause of fire deaths in the United States. And then that doesn't just impact one person who is living in one unit, that impacts the entire building. And we know that about 620 people over the age of 35 die every year from those fires. So not only are there people who are losing their property and the developers who are losing their property, but there are individuals who are losing their lives. And I don't know if you've ever lived in multi-unit housing, but I have. And secondhand smoke exposure is definitely something that has come up as a an issue of complaint that one person might not like that their neighbor is smoking and there are just all kinds of complaints to the management. And we know that having smoke-free policies in place actually reduces that likelihood. And so one other thing that we like to say is that smoke-free smoke -free development, smoke-free multi-unit housing, they're in high demand. There have been several statewide surveys that have shown that as many as 78%, including smokers of tenants, would choose to live in a smoke-free complex. Now, if we took that down to non-smokers, it would be far higher. And if we're looking at the 2018 report, Less than 21% of Ohioans currently smoke, and we do have a little higher than that percentage here in Columbus, so we wanted to look at some local data. There we go. So Columbus Public Health actually put out a survey. We just finished this at the end of September, and although we only had 350 responses, so it's a small sample size, we did want to show you what some of the outcomes were. So the question was, smoking should not be allowed in multi-unit housing residences or any living quarters where secondhand smoke infiltration may occur. Do you strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree? And you can see just from the bar graph over here on the side, and if you look at the answers over here on the right-hand side as well, you can see that over 80% of respondents agree or strongly agree that there should not be secondhand smoke exposure within multi-unit housing. And my son's going to sing to you now. Um, <laughs> and when you look at those who disagree, they're actually much less than the percentage of smokers within our community. So even smokers agree that multi-unit housing residences should be smoke free. And we're seeing this, this isn't the first time we've done this survey. We've done this survey since 2017, which has included this question every year. And we're seeing more and more people agree or strongly agree with this statement. And then moving on, I did want to share another survey result with you from our survey um, that showed in the past seven days, which of the following places have you smelled secondhand tobacco smoke? And that top one there is in your home. So some people may not under have understood the question, but those who did likely were sitting within their homes and smelled secondhand smoke from some other house. Maybe that was another house, another unit, a person passing by, but it's getting into their home in some way. And a lot of people are being exposed at outdoor events too. So we know that people are at work, they're at outdoor events, they're at indoor events, they're being exposed all these other ways. One way that we can try to prevent negative health outcomes from that exposure is by implementing a policy. So how can Columbus Public Health help? 
Um, Columbus Public Health provides a lot of free resources, including smoke free signage. So if you implement a policy and we can help walk you through that process, we can help provide policy language. We can provide these residency property management toolkits. We can provide consultations and presentations to the property owners, managers, whoever you'd like. And occasionally we can provide resident education as well. So let us know what it is that you need. We can help you with that. And after we go through all that process, these signs that you can see over here on the left hand side of the screen. These signs are approximately 18 inches by 12 inches. They're metal and they have the holes already drilled in them so they're easy to hang. We don't have the post to be able to hang them. I do tell people that ahead of time. You could put on the side of a building or your own post but the signs are metal so they will be able to stay outside. They last a long time and we can give you as many as you need all for free. Other things we can help with is a sample lease addendum. So some people think, you know, I'd like to start something like this. I'd like to fit. I'd like to figure out how to get it all implemented, but I don't even know what the language is I should use. So we can provide a sample lease addendum. If you already have one that you've created, we can provide feedback on it. So we can say, oh, have you thought about how you would enforce this policy? Have you thought about having uh, a grandfather period? Is that something that you'd like to have? Is that something you'd not like to have? Um, if you have any kind of issues with someone who is smoking, have you thought about a three strikes policy? Those sorts of things. We can help give you advice. We can help walk you through what that process is. Whatever it is that you need, we're partners to be able to make that happen. And then what are some of the steps to going smoke free? So first of all, you can work with us to develop a plan of action. Um, you communicate with your residents. So I always like to say that we do six months, three months, and then 90 days. If you've already got people living in your units, we don't want to just flip it tomorrow and say all of a sudden you're smoke free. We like to give people some time to change and time to get used to the idea of change. And so if you are starting brand new and you are just now building or you are just now developing, then that would be a totally different story. You can start from day one with a smoke free policy and people who sign up already know that. So it depends on your situation, whatever you need, we're willing to be flexible with you on that. And then with the communication of residents, we can often pro provide resident empowerment meetings, which is basically we get everybody together in the same room. We talk about what those changes are going to look like, and then they have their, their opportunity to ask any questions. And we would do that with you. That's not something we would do by ourselves. We would do that with you in there in the same room so you can ask questions. And if we do a virtual option, that's fine as well. And then we would help you identify the correct places to locate your signage so that way it can be most utilized. So we would put it rather than, you know, in a dark hallway, we would put it out by the parking lots where anyone walking in would automatically see it, things like that. And we would also provide cessation resources. So here's a couple examples of some of the cessation resources we can provide. We refer everyone to the Ohio Tobacco Quit Line which is free to all residents of Ohio who are 18 years old and over. And we can, uh, the Ohio Quit Line provides 90 days of nicotine replacement therapy for free. So you don't have to have a certain kind of insurance. You don't have to have insurance at all. It is completely free and you just are able to find what works for you to create your own quit plan or your residents are able to. And some of those things that they provide are gum, lozenges, patches, et cetera. And all of their, their plan is completely individualized. Now, for those of you who have been privy to the e-cigarette ep epidemic, especially amongst youth, we do have services for youth cessation as well. So maybe you implement, implemented a policy and the parents are on board, but then somebody reported there was secondhand smoke coming out of the unit and it actually turned out to be a child. Well, we would refer to My Life, My Quit, which is also a program of the Tobacco Quit Line, but it's specifically designed for youth ages 13 to 17. And they also can get an individualized quit plan. They have phone and text message options and they receive a certificate of completion at the end. So those are some of the different things that we can help you with. If you have any questions, I'm totally open to those. And here's my contact information. 
Since I am working from home and not out of the office right now, please feel free to email me. I do get back to you pretty quickly. A phone number just isn't the most useful to be able to contact me right now. So I will turn it over to Rita if we've got any comments or if anybody has any questions. Okay, so if you do have questions for Elizabeth, um, you can unmute yourself and ask the question or you can put it in the chat and I would be happy to share that. All righty. Um, Elizabeth, one of the good news pieces of this is, is that our, most of our developers are already very much on board with doing smoke-free housing. So this has not been a hard sell, but we want to continue to emphasize to our developers how important this is. If you have existing properties and you're contemplating going smoke-free, Elizabeth is the contact person that can, you can work with to help facilitate that. And uh, obviously it's, it's of great importance that we have the healthiest housing possible. So Elizabeth, thank you very much. I, I just want the record to reflect that Elizabeth did take a beating through this, this presentation, but it was not from the developers or from the, her colleagues at the city. Um, and how you got through that, I don't know, but like I said, I totally sympathize and appreciate with how much you're juggling and I really appreciate your being with us today to share that information. So, Next up, um, we have, and this is a new presentation, but we are very excited about it. Uh, probably about six weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Jenna Tapaldi and Jesse Kaliski. Uh, they are associated with the Department of Public Utilities and they are looking at opportunities for electric vehicles and um, the charging stations that go with them. So I am going to introduce them and ask them to take it away. Hi everybody, thanks so much Rita um, and to the uh, development department for this time to speak with you all about electric vehicle adoption and charging infrastructure. Um, my name is Jenna Tapaldi. I'm the climate advisor for the city of Columbus through the American Cities Climate Challenge. Um, Pre-pandemic, I was working in the office of working out of the Office of Sustainability um, at DPU, and um, Jesse is with us. She's a consultant for the American Cities Climate Challenge. Um, so we're excited to be here and speak with you all today. Next slide. So quick agenda for our time together. Um, I'll give some background and a little bit of an intro of who we are, why we're here, talk about Columbus's climate and equity goals and targets. And then Jesse will get into some of the benefits of EV charging infrastructure and talk about some of the next steps that we can collectively take together to advance this work. Next slide. Awesome. So to help set the context for everybody, um, we go back in time a little bit. In the end of 2018, the city became part of the American Cities Climate Challenge, um, which is what brings Jesse and I here today. The Climate Challenge focuses on advancing city programs and policies centered around the buildings and the transportation sector. And part of the transportation work that we do is changing the way that people get around our town and encouraging them to use public transit, to walk, to bike, ensuring that they can do those three things safely, and then focusing on transitioning from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. And so while our overall portfolio of work that the city is taking from the Office of Sustainability focuses on all five of these little icons that you see on the left side of the screen, um, what Jesse and I are focused on for this presentation is the electric vehicle adoption component. And so in order to see widespread adoption of electric vehicles, we know that we need three specific components in place. The first is really well done education and community outreach around the benefits of electric vehicles. We know that we need strong and fair financing options for the residents who want to purchase or lease these cars. And then we need a way to charge them at home and at work. And so that is where you all come in. Next slide. So why is this important? Why are we talking about it now? So in February of this year, Mayor Ginther set out a goal that our city and our community would be carbon neutral by 2050. And in part of that goal, he set out an equity agenda that has each department focus on how we can improve the lives of our most vulnerable residents. And this nexus of climate and equity is really where um, widespread EV adoption lands and how pursuing this work can help advance those two goals. And so 
each year, the Office of Sustainability within the Department of Utilities does a greenhouse gas inventory, which measures how much emissions come from each sector. And we have seen that um, in our latest greenhouse gas inventory, 38% of our community-wide emissions come from the transportation sector. And the vast majority of this is from tailpipe emissions from single occupancy vehicle cars. The unfortunate news about this number is that it continues to go up each year and it's increasing actually faster than our population growth. So we know that we need some intervention and we need to take action to reduce this number. And so in order to start to do that, the city has a climate action plan that's in its draft mode or its draft phase. And it sets out some transportation goals as it relates to EV adoption. And one of those is a very bold goal, which is that by 2050, 100% of vehicles sold will be electric. Um, we know that in order to make that goal happen, there are a lot of important stakeholders that need to come to play. Um, but what we're seeing from trends across the country and other cities and from um, manufacturers and vehicle developers is that um, electric vehicles are here and they're gonna continue to be here. We're seeing increasing numbers on our roads each year. And um, we, we are here to <laughs> Yeah, with you guys a little bit about the, what the benefits are of EVs and about charging infrastructure um, and hopefully continue to drive some change. We know that the sooner that we can start this transition in a widespread way, the sooner that we can recognize the benefits. And so I'll turn it over now to Jesse to get into the benefits a little bit more. Great. Thanks, Donna. So a key thing here is that the availability of charging infrastructure is fundamental for encouraging EV adoption. Um, and doing EV adoption has benefits uh, not only to you all, which we'll describe in more detail, um, but also to your tenants and society at large. Um, so we'll take a deeper dive in the next five minutes into these, but as a high level um, for your, your tenants, internal combustion engine vehicles contribute significantly to air pollution. So, and this often disproportionately impacts vulnerable minority and low income populations. Thinking about the city and societal goals, um, as Jenna mentioned previously, the city has a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, with transportation playing a critical role there. So providing a conducive environment for EV adoption will lead to significantly cleaner air and water across our community. And then finally, there are benefits to you as developers beyond your contributions to society and adding value to your tenants. Um, there is a financial benefit as well. So being EV ready um, upfront, so installing EV charging infrastructure during construction can save you a lot of money down the line. So if we double click on the benefits uh, to tenants and society, um, we, we see that charging happens overnight. So according to research, 80% um, of charging occurs at home overnight. So as a result, charging infrastructure availability is, is truly a prerequisite for EV adoption. Um, Moreover, availability is not only for the sake of enabling uh, individuals to own electric vehicles, but it also comes with benefits to your tenants' health and their pockets, um, as well as society collectively. Um, so as mentioned, regarding health, EVs lead to cleaner air and reduce health risks, including asthma and heart attack. In terms of transportation costs, um, low to moderate income households have limited income and a significant portion is spent on transportation. Um, EV ownership has proven over the long term to be a cheaper option, especially with lower maintenance costs and gas savings. And then finally, societally, fewer greenhouse gas emissions due to EVs will not only have immediate benefits on our air quality, um, but will also ensure our future generations obtain these benefits down the line. So most importantly, the benefits to you all, um, in terms of becoming EV ready. Um, first, this is a great leadership opportunity um, and a way for you to pave the way to a more resilient and equitable society. Um, second, many cities have put in place EV charging infrastructure ordinances. Um, Columbus is in the early stages of development. So by acting now, you will prepare yourself for a potential future ordinance. And then finally, um, there have been many studies released that have shown that EV readiness investments during construction significantly outweigh future ret retrofit costs. Um, almost up to savings up to 75%. And so now what can you do? So first talk to us. Um, um, we know we whizzed through this PowerPoint in like five, 10 minutes. Um, so we're happy to talk into you more depth about um, what we're doing, what the city is doing and how you can get involved. Um, and then to complement that, I think it's important to look at the spectrum of EV readiness. So as you see on the right hand side, um, you can be EV capable, EV ready, or actually have EV uh, infrastructure installed. So thinking about what's ready, uh, what's right for you um, at this time. And if you
you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Den Jenna or myself. Jenna's contact information is on here. I'm sure she probably prefers email as well as phone calls. Maybe Jenna, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, we'll pause for now and, and thank you. Okay, Jenna and Jesse, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Jenna and Jesse? Okay, obviously this is a very exciting opportunity and this is a wonderful opportunity to get into the ground floor of uh, being part of our future and being carbon neutral and energy efficient. Um, I thank Jenna and Jesse for taking time to share with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, and obviously you've got Jenna's contact information if you wanna do some follow up. Okay, next up we have um, a, a face you should know and that is Robert Morris. And Robert is uh, part of the new grants management team in the Department of Finance uh, with the city. And he is primary, well, I'm sure he's got many, many things, but uh, from our perspective, one of his primary jobs is being um, the person who does environmental assessments. So um, we wanted him to talk a little bit about what his expectations were. The one thing I will quickly remind you of is that while Robert is a fabulous resource, Robert is not the, the place where you start when you have discussions about finalizing a project. Robert is a resource that we as the staff of the city will utilize. You do not get to play, I'm thinking of a site game with Robert and start running 10 or 15 sites past him before you decide which one you wanna submit. But I think it's really important because this has to be a collaborative process as we move forward. Um, Robert was kind enough to say he would do the presentation, so we're very grateful for that. Um, and we want you to get to know him. He is, so far, he's done a wonderful job. So, uh, Robert, take it away. Thanks so much, Rita. I appreciate it. Can you hear me all right? I can. All right, like uh, like Rita said, um, my name is Robert Morris. I'm a planner too within the Department of Finance and Management on the grants management team. Um, uh, the grants management team does um, all of the environmental reviews, like Rita said, um, for our HUD funded projects. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Give me one second. Is that coming through, Rita? Yep. Okay. You're good. All right. Like I said, Robert Morris with uh, the grants management team in the Department of Finance and Management. First, I wanted to just go over a couple basics. Um, these are from the HUD Exchange, and HUD Exchange itself is a great resource. Um, if you're gonna be working with HUD funded projects, um, there's a plethora of resources um, on, on their website. Um, an environmental review is uh, the process of reviewing a project and its potential environmental impacts to determine whether it meets federal, state, and local environmental standards and laws and authorities as well. The environmental review process is required for all HUD assisted projects to ensure that the proposed project does not negatively impact the surrounding environment, that being human natural environment as well. Okay, um, there are multiple levels of environmental review. Um, the first being exempt, this is gonna be um, things like engineering and architecture, environmental studies, and the administration of the grants themselves. Um, categorically excluded projects, and there's actually two levels within that, um, subject to laws and authorities and not subject to. Uh, these are things like tenant-based rental assistance, home buyer assistance, um, acquisitions, and um, as well as rehab, there are certain stipulations that um, for the rehabs, they have to um, not change land use, they have to um, not expand a footprint beyond 20%, and they can't cost more than 75% of the replacement value um, of the building being rehabbed. Um, number three, environmental assessments is where the vast majority 
of your guys's projects that you'll be involved with the city fall under um these are these are essentially all other projects that aren't in the first two all new construction um and anything that doesn't uh doesn't come to be found as a uh, significant impact on the environment and then the fourth one is ones that we try to stay away from the environmental impact study um we probably won't see many or really any of those. Uh, we, we try and stay away from those. Um, here is a flow chart that is provided by HUD. And I know it's a lot here, but if you look to the right here under the environmental assessment, um, this is kind of the, the flow of how the projects that you guys are gonna be involved with go. Um, there's a, a statutory checklist, which is um, done through the HERO software um, that HUD provides. And uh, if you move down, a finding of no, of no significant impact is what we try and get to. Um, and then it mentions a, a notice of intent to request for the release of funds, um, which comes with a 15-day um, period. And I'll get into more detail of these um, notices and comment periods. Once that 15 day public comment period that we put out is completed, we send a request for release of funds into HUD. And then as you see, they have a 15 day period to receive objections as well. Once that period has completed without objection, um, they authorize the use uh, to utilize grant funds. And that's the completion of the environmental review. Here's what the timeline looks um, for us. And as Rita mentioned, the, the planning of uh, the project, this doesn't involve myself or um, my team as far as your guys' um, housing development projects. That is step one. Um, the step two would be the submittal of all the required information to the City of Columbus Department of Development. And that will be, um, then it'll be on the Department of Development to coordinate with my team at Grants Management to set up the environmental reviews um, for all the projects that they've selected and, and uh, to move forward. Step three, uh, Grants Management conducts and compiles the environmental review. That'll be doing site visits, um, putting all the information into the HUD software. And once that is complete, we publish a public notice into the newspaper. Um, for most of these projects that are going to be environmental assessments that come with a finding of no significant impact. A lot of acronyms, we call that the FONSI. That is a 15 day public comment period. Um, once that's finished, we send in our request for release of funds to HUD and step five, the magical authorization to utilize grant funds. And once that, uh, once we receive that, I'm pretty much, um, done with my process and the funds are available uh, once that's done. Okay. Here's the required information. There's a lot on here, but I wanted to include it all because I'm gonna be able to send this to you guys so you could look back at it later. But I just wanna highlight a few of these um, that are really important. They all are important, but um, to start, the first one there, a project description with a total anticipated scope of the project. This is extremely important. Um, so let's say there's a phase one and an anticipated phase two of a project. The entire anticipated scope needs to be included in the project description. Um, site plan, locations, obviously, of where it is. Uh, we need a, a narrative on existing. Um, of the um, an, a few of the other really important things are SHPO approval, um, which is the State Historic Preservation Office, um, noise study if that's needed, uh, a phase one, phase two, some of those outside studies. It's best to have those done. Um, and really that's the only way we're gonna accept them is if all of the information is complete in order to begin the review. Um, because when these things get done, when they don't get done up front, it ends up uh, really delaying the environmental review process um, because you're waiting on different outside agencies that can take an exorbitant amount of time, um, it seems, these days. Uh, 
And here's a little bit more on those timelines out of outside coordination. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office can take up to 30 days. Um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, 30 to 45 days. And lately it's been really more on the 45 day end of that. Um, and then the public comment periods. Uh, for the city of Columbus, we have a 15 day public comment period uh, for our posting. It'll be in the dispatch and that, that's for all the environmental assessment projects. And then HUD has another 15 days once we send in our request. Um, as far as the time that grants management will take to compile once we receive everything to um, get to the point where we're done with our review and can send to uh, public notice, we take about 15 to 30 days, depending on um, how many projects we've got at, at the time. Um, these, I really wanted to stress these these days because it's our goal to work with um, the Department of Development and uh, and with you guys as well to get these projects through the process as quickly um, as possible while being fully compliant um, with HUD's regulations, laws, and authorities. So it's important to know that these days they don't move. It's a 15-day comment period no matter what. That can't be adjusted. So um, it's important to know those dates and, and uh, time periods. And again, here's my contact information. Um, you will probably work more closely with Department of Development and we work with them, um, but here's my contact information if you have any questions for me as well. And thank you, Rita, and everyone else for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Does anybody have any questions for Robert? Yeah, hi, Rita. This is Stephanie Rhodes. I have a question. Um, I, I wanted to see, Robert, if you could clarify, it sounded like you said that in order to help us fast track this process, you would prefer that we work with SHPO, ODNR, and request a noise study prior to submitting our environmental review package. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Yeah, when, app, when applicable. Not all projects will need a noise study. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. let, let me jump in there, um, Stephanie. For the SHPO review, we prefer that you work through our team and we will work with SHPO to get the historic review. Okay. Thank you, Rita. Sure. Does I anybody else have honest. questions? All right. Okay. I figured well, out how to stop you. sharing. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's great. No, it's all good. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you being with us today. Okay, next up, the, the moment you have all been waiting for, um, an overview of the 2021 multifamily process. Uh, for this handout, um, let's see. Now, if I can just get the right one. Let's try. That one, yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, we're just going to use the closing checklist um, a little bit. And then um, the other thing we want to focus on is sort of the application process. So, Tracy, can you get us started on the application process? So are you going to put up the application or you want to start with the closing checklist? I can. I can. I can. I'll put, I up, can. I'll put, up, I'll put up the application. I'll put up the application. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, stop. Stop. All right. All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. So, Tracy, what tab do you want it on? Let's start with the instructions on the first page, first tab. Okay. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here we go with the new and improved 2021 application. 
Uh, as you see on the instructions, they're going to be due Monday, January 4th by 3 o'clock. And because of COVID, we probably will not be in the office. But if you are going to submit by disc or thumb, you need to let me know in advance so somebody can be there to receive it because there is nobody in the office. If you're going to send me a OneDrive or Dropbox link, that'll be just fine. We'll see if we can make it work. OneDrive is not very friendly from what I've encountered so far, but uh, Dropbox link works well. Hello? We have a question. Okay. We have a question. Somebody okay, was talking. Ahead. Ahead. Anyway. Okay. So, like I said, uh, January 4th by 3 o'clock. Next screen. Next tab. I don't think anything okay. has changed on this tab for you veterans. Uh, what is checked? Uh, that needs to be included in your proposal is still the same. It's not big enough for me, be, for me to be able to read it, Rita, but I know what's there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, let's go to general information tab. Um, the, again, nothing's changed on this page except for another emphasis on uh making the contact person for the application someone who is knowledgeable of the project and accessible it does not need to be the entity ceo who's going to be you know not available for questions it needs to be somebody who who is knowledgeable and accessible to the pro project um the DUNS number comes into play once you get, if you are funded, when I send you uh, your congratulations letter, I need you to start working on your, uh, the entity to be funded and their EIN or tax ID and that DUNS number. You need to get that process started. Some days it takes you know, two or three days, and sometimes it takes two or three months. So you need to get started on that. Down a little bit, Rita. Sure. Sure. There's the notation for uh, what we need. And then on the very bottom of the general information screen, you need to check and tell me what you want and when. I mean, I understand their tax credit applications. But, you know, you need to give that check mark because I may not be the only person processing this and everybody will need to know what to do. Okay, next screen. And again, the project information page you know, I need I need the appropriate boxes checked as usual. And and please fill in the information about which pool you are uh, you anticipate applying for, so we'll know uh, what other what other processes we need to get through. And all the rest of that is pretty explanatory. Okay, housing type. You see the box for smoke free is already filled in, yes. Make sure you leave it that way. <laughs> and then separate those units so I know which ones are which. On the uh, operating costs, uh, 
the way our performance is set up, I need these categories to stay the way they are. When you put asset management over under maintenance, it makes for an interesting uh, performer at the end, so I need it to stay where it is. Uh, you know what your annual replacement reserves per units are, and uh, of course the length of uh, affordability for the majority of the projects will always be 20 years for new construction, and when you have uh, rehab, it it, it is commensurate with how much you are asking for per assisted unit. So that would be uh, uh, probably 15 years because we're we would try to stay out of Davis Bacon, and and with the uh, prescribed amount of applicate per application of 300,000, we would probably take one or two units. And then, then it would be a 15-year compliance for a rehab. Onward. On the utility allowance, please note, home-funded projects must be uh, send us the HUSM, the HUD utility schedule module, it is not acceptable to send the 52667, even for project-based projects. I need the HUSM. And then on the uh, contact information, please fill this in. And I mean, I understand that you know, we we are a to-be-formed entity, but you need to let me know who you're planning on working with. So filling out, down, Rita, uh, filling in this information is very helpful to me. And if, like, once again, if it is to be decided, I understand that. But when you already know somebody's in the game, you just let me know. Okay. Site information. Come down a little bit. All of this information about where where your option is and who's the option from and all this information is very pertinent. When you get funded, I know how to uh, work with Robert to make sure that we get your EA started and completed prior to your expiration of a purchase contract or uh, an option to lease. And as for your uh, loan information, is it zoned correctly? Uh, that, like I said, uh, we understand it's a work in progress, but if you know what's going on, you need to let us know. And all those, all the information about uh, will you need a variance? Will a variance be required and everything? You'll be starting on that before you get me to that. Get to this application, so you should know all that. Source of funds. This is this is pretty self-explanatory. I've worked primarily to try to get that type to do something fancy over on the uh, uh, performer, but it hasn't worked out just yet, but we, we'll get it. <laughs> and where are, my, where are the little boxes, Rita? That's, you know, has little your own biggest... The little boxes are gone. 
For what, Tracy? For what, Tracy? Has the firm commitment for the oh. first mortgage. Huh. The, yeah. The, the answer to questions, okay. one, two, and three, there That's used right. to be little boxes over there for yes and no. They left. All right. I All promise right. I we'll get that. Them. We'll get that before we send it out. And the same for the construction. Yeah, the low boxes are gone again. And all that should equal up in that low box there. Uh, and this is the project budget. And again, I you know need all the cost, and then I need to know how much you want from city funds, and then how much you want from other funds, and then that last column is the source of the other funds. So if it's equity, perm, construction, Whatever it is, I need that over in that last column to know what's going where. Okay, and just for, um, just for um, FYI, FYI, in, um, in the total, um, the total cost, development that cost, cost, that would translate that would to page one of the application, one of the application. and the city funds and requested the city funds loss request for the page one. So page one in so this page, page should, in always, this be should always be in agreement. Okay. And this is the page uh, you either need to electronically sign or print it off and sign it and send it, scan it back in or whatever you need to do to give me a signed application. And then that last page builds itself. Go down to the bottom, Rita. And this corner page for the, this bottom corner of the page for the assumptions, you need to fill me in on a tentative date and how many months are gonna be in your first year. And if you have other income, you need to explain to me what it is, where, where its source is, and if that needs to be linked back to your uh, operating expense page, I'd appreciate that information so I don't have to ask. And what else we got down there in tiny print? Maybe this we can link that. Print. Okay. No, I'm talking about, I, I still can't see it, Rita. It's still teeny tiny on my screen. <laughs> uh, your replacement reserves and everything. Make sure this information does correspond with the uh, operating expense page. Make sure that they're the same numbers going over there so that I can get that figured out. And then the, that page will populate and I'll take a look at it. Okay, and keep okay. in mind keep that in what, mind we're, looking that what we're looking for is that the hard debt coverage hard ratio, coverage ratio, ratio is right here, right here, with the exception of the year that it starts up, to be 1.2 to 1.5. For the and duration the of the affordability. Right. Right. And we're, we're giving you and this because we this want you to have some idea. Have this some is idea. like a rough this draft. Like a rough draft. And, we and we want you to be able to, to look at it and say, yeah, this is going to underwrite okay. All righty. Anything else on the application? Anything else on the application? No. Okay. Okay. Do we have any questions, have on, any the questions on the application? I've got somebody who's oh, asked uh, if the landlord pays all utilities, do you still need to do an HUSM? And the answer is no. And the answer is no. Okay. All right. Any other all questions? Right. Any other questions?
Okay. Okay. Okay, so a few more things okay, so relative, more things to, relative to, to program overview. Program hey, Tracy, I'm going to mute you. Okay, thanks. We tend to echo each other. A um, couple, couple of other things. So um, the guidelines that we are publishing are basically allowing projects to apply for up to $300,000 per project. Um, at this point in time, we don't believe that there are going to be additional funds available. So do not come in with an application that requires $750,000 of city home funds because it's going to be rejected. Sources do not equal uses. With that being said, we do understand as these projects go through the development process that things do change with time. If you are successful in the 9% competition and are funded and then subsequently determine that $300,000 is not going to be sufficient gap financing, please let, have a conversation with us and we can determine whether we have access to funds to assist you in filling gaps. But the thing that you need to understand is, is that we are going to prioritize those projects that have elected to do at least some 30% units and are willing to commit those 30% units to individuals who are in shelter. So this is very comparable to the program we did in 2020. We are asking folks to look at those households that are in shelter with an income. The income is sufficient to cover a 30% rent. And that, that uh, household, the only negative thing on their background check is an eviction for non-payment of rent. We have lots of folks in our community who have incomes who are paying outrageous amounts of rent that they cannot afford who are in desperate need of affordable housing. And this is one of the ways that we are trying to link our housing and homelessness initiatives. So if you think that you might want extra money, you need to make that election at the time that the application is made. You make the election by including it in your project narrative that you are committing that the 30% units will be prioritized for households in the shelter system. So please keep that in mind. Smoke-free housing, we've had obviously some discussion about that already. Our basic understanding with our development community is that with the exception of permanent supportive housing, all units are to be smoke-free. And, and that is really non-negotiable. That is one of the real basic things that we want. Um, we have found that that's not been difficult because there are lots of points in the enterprise green community system for smoke-free housing, so we have not gotten a lot of pushback, but just understand if you're signing up for another program, it's not gonna work for us. We really want you to be on board. Um, so a couple things um, for those who are actually, um, who make it through this process and, and find some success at the end of the rainbow in May um, with OFA and are funded. Because we do not have a next steps meeting like OFA does, we need to share this information with you right now. And that is where we get to the oh so wonderful checklist that I shared too early. Let's see. Okay, so the closing checklist. So, um, you know, we've talked about the timeline for the project. Do not take any choice limiting actions until such time as you have completed the environmental assessment. One of the very first steps of that is completing the Section 106 workbook. We have an Excel workbook with a variety of pictures that need to be included. Um, this is another one we're trying to email to the city has been a challenge. And if you have a Dropbox or some similar account that you can share with us, that is probably the best way to go. Um, and an alteration form, which talks a little bit about what it is that you're doing. We also are looking for a relocation packet for the environmental review and assessment. And we did go through this list of things with Robert when he spoke about what we need in order to uh, provide all the information that he needs to do his review as quickly as possible. 
at the time that you are moving forward, it is very likely that you're going to need to update your application. It may be that you have added new members to your development team, or you have selected members that weren't previously selected, or heaven forbid, because no one in this business ever changes jobs, um, you may have some new team members, or you may have some team members that aren't with you any longer. So please send us updated resumes on your development team. Please send us your current market study. The market study must be less than two years old. Firm financing commitments. This has been a big sticking point. We are not doing this to be mean. We are doing this because the home regulations now state that all funding must be firmly committed prior to the commitment of home funds. The sticking point on this seems to be dealing with construction loans where they do not like to write commitment letters. What we have done with several of our developers is we have received an email from their loan officer stating that XYZ Bank has approved this construction loan and you may consider it committed. We are putting that in the file, we are relying on it. So um, we are, you know, we do understand that it's a challenge. We feel that we really have to dot the I's and cross the T's on this requirement because it is definitely written in the home, home regulations. An updated application and vendor registration. So it's very important that we have those. Um, part of the reason that we need those is that um, it has been decided that all larger home projects, and that means projects with LIHTC that are getting $200,000, $300,000 in home funds, are required to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis by Columbus City Council. In order for us to submit an ordinance for council's consideration, the entity that is um, taking the funds, or basically the recipient of the funds, must be listed in the city's vendor registration system. The only thing I can tell you about the vendor registration system in case you have not experienced it personally is that no one would rate it highly on user friendliness. Luckily, we have found somebody in vendor services who has been a tremendous help to many of our recipients. And we will be happy if you start running into challenges to provide that contact information at the time. Um, so it, in terms of the legislation process, expect from the time that all of the different requirements are finalized, that it's going to be four to six weeks to get it to city council, to get that legislation written, to get it reviewed and approved and queued up on the city council agenda. Also keep in mind that city council does not meet from the middle of December until the middle of January and the entire month of August until after Labor Day. So do not come in on July 29th with I need to get this done in six weeks because it isn't going to happen. Um, please be very cognizant of the timelines so that we can get this done. I know this is new. This isn't something that we're really excited about but it is something that we have to do. Okay, next up, we talk about um, the legal description of the property and the parcel number. In order to complete the mortgage and restrictive covenant, we need a good, solid, accurate legal description. So please give that along with a parcel number. Operating agreement. We need the operating agreement because our repayment of our soft loan is based on cash flow as defined in the operating agreement. So we give you a lot of latitude in terms of how you define this. If you cannot provide us with even a draft of the operating agreement that gives us a definition, one can and will be provided for you that you probably will not like, just so you, you understand that that's the way it works. Plans and specifications. As a general rule, we defer to the building standards that have been accepted by OFA. However, one of our big challenges is, is if we do not know what you are building, it's very hard for us to tell if it's been built correctly. 
So please provide your plans and specifications. There will be a cursory review before the start of construction. There will be a pre-construction meeting <coughs> and there will be site visits as um, opportunity presents itself to go out to the site to make sure things are being built the way that you said they were. Now, once again, Changes happen. We know that there are change orders. We are not clairvoyant. So please, if you have changes in your plans, please communicate them. Okay, the other thing we're looking for is a cost breakdown. Any detail that you can provide us for the cost breakdown to show that we are meeting the expectation of HUD, that the costs are reasonable, is very much appreciated. Um, something a little bit stronger than trust me, it's good enough for OFA would be really helpful. Okay. Um, so those are some of the big issues in terms of next step. Rita, okay. I just yeah. wanted to say yeah. that the Construction cost breakdown is something that Robert needs for the EA. So you need to give me that okay. before you decide okay. to close. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tracy. So keep in mind that um, once we start the EA process, we have provided Robert with information of how much funding, which account in the home, you know, which year of home and whatever it's coming out of. And Robert is moving forward based on that information. So if you have a change, if you come back and decide all of a sudden you need $50,000 more, that means that we need to work with Robert to determine, <coughs> excuse me, what kind of notification we need to do because of that change dollar amount. It is probably going to slow down your closing. So please do not save the surprises for, for right before closing. Also, when we do our loan documents, we are specifying in the loan documents that we are specifically subordinating to your construction loan and to your permanent loan and who those lenders are and what the dollar amounts are. If you turn around, and then go out and get a new loan, construction loan or permanent loan from a different lender for a larger dollar amount, we are not authorized to sign that subordination until such time as city council has approved the modification of the loan documents. So please, as you are making changes in your project, starting from the time that your initial proposal gets to us until after closing, you have to keep us informed of changes because they can negatively impact your ability to get your project clear through the fin to the finish line of the finishing process. The other thing to keep in mind is that under the home regulations, we are now required at the conclusion of construction of the project to do a final closeout underwrite. This underwrite requires that you update your sources and uses, that you provide us with all financing sources, that if your costs have gone up, your budget needs to be altered and you need to show us how you have covered those shortfalls, that if you get a new loan that has covered some of those shortfalls, we need to know about it, that if the rents have increased since your initial application, that, that those rents, the new rents are the, are the current rents being charged, excuse me, the, the objective is to make sure that the funding we have provided is in fact donated. Also, as part of the closeout process, we need a rent roll showing us what your home is, what, which units are your home assisted units at lease up. Even if they float, that's okay, but we need to know what those initial home units are. That is something that we have to notify HUD of. <coughs> Excuse me. So a couple other things that I wanted to share in this process. Number one, um, for bond projects. This year, um, shortly before the OFA deadline for the HDAP GAP bond funded round, um, we got a slew 
literally some of them within like hours of when they needed their support letter saying that we would give them money. If you have read the newspapers, you might know that the city is sort of broke right now and we do not have a lot of excess funding. Furthermore, we cannot possibly start turning applications around in a one to two day period. So keep in mind, as OSA builds out its schedule for the HDAP bond funded round next year, we will be sending all of you a notice indicating that if you intend to apply, that you need to submit proposal materials, and it's probably going to be two to four weeks prior to the deadline so that we are not running fire drills like we did this year. We are older and wiser. So um, we have gone through a lot of information here. You are probably wondering, where is my flash drive? Clearly, um, the cookies and the flash drives both went away with the virtual uh, meeting that we're having today. So we will be using the mailing list of people who indicated in the invite that they were attending to send out materials. If you snuck in on somebody else's invite, please send me an email and let me know that you would like our materials and I will include you on that mailing list. So we will ho hopefully today, maybe tomorrow, but we will be sending those materials out. Okay, so I feel like I've talked forever. Are there any questions? Tracy, do you have anything you want to supplement? No, I don't have anything else. I was... Who's got a puppy barking? <laughs> uh, I, I don't have anything else. Are we going to put up the guidelines or the NOFA? Um. I think you went over all of it, even though you didn't put it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. try. Let's I'm try. Let's see. see. That is not it. That is not it. Nope. Let's try. Let's try. All right. All right. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Okay, like I said, I think you went over most of it. Uh, the form of proposal, again, your electronic via disk, thumb, and all of that good stuff is going to still, you're, once again, if you're going to send me something, some piece of media, thumb or disc or whatever, you're going to have to let me know in advance when you expect it to be delivered and via mail, FedEx or whatever, if you're trying to send it to me in a hard piece of media, because I have to make arrangements for somebody to be there to receive it. because. If it just gets thrown out at the front desk, there is no guarantee that we will get that. And we are not in the yeah. office. Yeah. So we we just need to keep reiterating that. Okay, also okay. keep in mind, also keep um, in mind several, people um, several people have submitted their application on, on in PDF. In PDF. Please give us Please back the original Excel. It makes downloading it information, makes downloading much, information easier. much easier. This is true. Also, Thank you. Is, also, just, also, as I look at this, keep in mind, um, contact, the um, contact the Department of Neighborhood. 614-645-1900. And make sure and that make you, sure are, making that you are making a presentation to your neighborhood, to your neighborhood association. association. So it could be an area so commission, it, it, it could be a neighborhood, uh, neighborhood you know, group. So it's, group. it's a variety so of it's things. It's a variety of things, but 
Make sure that you're reaching sure out to neighborhoods and identifying the appropriate organization. And we are going to be and looking, for, to some be looking for some indication that that presentation that that has happened, prior to, the happened prior to the application. At this point in time, this most of all, all of these organizations are meeting virtually. Are meeting virtually. Okay. We'll stop okay. that one. And there's also a uh, an outreach tab in the application that you need to put all of that information in on who you present it to and what, and include you know emails, whatever you did to present to the proper neighborhood civic or uh, area commission. Okay, next up okay, is, next the up is the guidelines. Most of this we have already covered. A list of eligible costs. Relocation, if you're working on an occupied property, please reach out to Gerald Furlow and talk to him about any relocation issues. We do not want everybody to be surprised at the last minute. Okay. Next up, we have the underwriting guidelines. Oh, no, we don't. I thought we had the underwriting guidelines. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so these are the underwriting guidelines. They talk about loan amount, loan security, who gets a grant, which really nobody does um, at this point in time, uh, what the affordability periods are, what kind of documentation we're looking for, completed application, market study, what information we're looking for in the market study, the subsidy layering review, uh, we look for, we do limit soft costs to 20% of the total development cost. Developer fee is a 15% operating and replacement reserve. Uh, we follow generally the OFA guideline on the replacement reserve. We need operating expenses that are within 15% of the OFA cost index. Now, I don't think that we had a single project this year that was within 15% of the OFA cost index. So we had one, okay, we had one. We had a whole bunch that weren't. If you are not within that 15%, why don't you take the time when you're submitting your final numbers to also share a waiver request on why it is that you can operate a property better than what the total average is for the OFA portfolio at this time. We are going to look at 7% vacancy rate, our income increases at 2%, our expenses at 3%. The utility allowance, as we discussed, needs to be the HUSM. It cannot be the housing authority utility allowance. We do not reimburse for organizational costs or syndication costs. Um, as indicated, and we discussed this, we require a second underwrite at completion. And um, if we have any CHOTOs that want to apply, they can. I will tell you that I love CHOTOs. I think they do really good work. At the present time, I do not believe that we have any CHOTOs that have sufficient capacity to meet the requirements for the home rules of owning, developing um, a, a, a tax credit project. It, it's just, it requires too much bandwidth I think we've got great photos, but nobody has, has reached that capacity point. So please do not submit, do not just show up with an, a CHOTO application to a tax credit project. You really need to reach out to Tracy. We need to have a discussion about whether we can support the project. Uh, if you show up at the last minute, your chances of getting a support letter 
go down dramatically if, if you have not had a discussion with us in advance. All right, I think that's all the fun stuff. Do we have any other questions? I'm gonna look, cause I thought I saw something in chat. Will this presentation be shared via email? Um, so um, yours truly forgot to hit the record button. So we got about halfway through Elizabeth's presentation before I hit the record button. So that piece of it, I will say for you, that is the best I can do. Um, any other questions? Okay, so we do have one more speaker. I think this is somebody, once again, that you wanna know because one of the requirements for multiple pools within the OFA contest is um, investment in the vicinity of the project. And so I've asked Mark Lundeen, who is my colleague, my uh, contemporary in the Economic Development Division, to share with us a little bit about what the Economic Development Division can do and what help they need from you in order to get you the best possible description of investment so that you can have a competitive application. So thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me, Rita. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, so just let me know when that pops up. Can you see it? Yep. All right, thanks. Uh, great to be on the call. I just want to run through a little bit of what the Economic Development Division does and the role that we play in this process. Uh, and then happy to answer any questions you have. So economic development division is really split into three groups. Um, we have a robust small business practice right now that is uh, doing a lot of work with thousands of businesses that try to keep the doors open um, through CARES Act funding and small grants. Um, but for purposes of this call, there are really two offices that relate to this effort. The first is the business attraction and expansion office. So this is kind of your traditional economic development activities where we're trying to grow jobs in the city. Our focus primarily is on existing companies that have the potential, existing companies in the city of Columbus that have the potential to expand. Uh, but we also obviously attract companies to the city of Columbus that are out of region. Um, through these, we have you know, a number of different financial incentives that we use on projects and also certainly um, just good old fashioned assistance um, with businesses. So here you see the small business um, arm. And again, most of our work this year is focused on the pandemic. And, CARES Act funding, small grants. So some of the things listed on here aren't exactly what we're doing this year, but we are, we've done over a uh, thousand grants to small businesses. Last piece is what we call our Office of Infrastructure Investments. So they're partnering on uh, public-private partnership projects around the city where uh, whether financial or you know managing the construction of new infrastructure, um, roads, utilities, parks, parking garages, you name it. And we have a series of tools that we use, such as tax increment financing, um, our city's capital dollars, um, a number of other sources that help private developers develop uh, things that are important for the city, so other employment centers, affordable housing projects, um, you know, projects that generally have a strong public component, public benefit to it. So you'll see here we track uh, investment, we track our infrastructure investment, the number of new jobs and retained jobs and payroll that's associated with that, and then the types of uses that we have in our projects. So in the five years that we've had a formal P3 program, you know, we've had over 170 projects. I think it's um, 
you know, nearing $4 billion in private investment. So it's a significant program. Uh, here's just a quick listing of the types of metrics that we look at. Again, new and retained jobs and payroll, um, property investment, uh, whether it's in a business side or the um, P3 side. And then our infrastructure investments and then allocation of um, space usage in, in project. So I pulled this from a couple years ago, so I hope it's still right. But um, our role in this process is really to document these these two pieces. So the investments that are happening within one mile of your development. And again, we work with the billing and general services group to um, document these, and then also the public infrastructure investments that are planned in the area. And again, this is a multi-departmental effort. A um, couple things to note, uh, we, we work with Rita's group to consolidate this information, send it back to you, you have some time to review it and provide additional um, projects that can add to it. But we, you know, sometimes don't have visibility to every single project out there. So we're working with building and zoning services, but there may be a project around the corner that, you know, the city for one way or another, uh, isn't tracking and, you know, aren't aware of. So if you do have projects like that, please document them and send us, um, you know, evidence that we can include in, in the letter. Um, and again, I think there is a little time, um, two weeks typically that we can go back and forth on this. Um, but we've been through it for a number of years and the Rita's group's been tremendously helpful. So we feel like we have a good project, uh, process. But here's my contact information. And again, um, and our whole office tends to help with this as we get into the time that we're looking at it. Any questions that I can answer on the inside? There's a question in the chat. Okay. It says the investment criteria has changed compared to what your presentation says. Uh, uh, it's uh, 10 million and two miles and a different time frame. Okay. Okay. I apologize. I took this I slide two years ago. Years ago. Okay. We'll, we'll okay. send we'll that. Send that. We'll we'll send make sure you have the current stuff. Have the current stuff. All right. Any other All right. questions? Any for other Mark? questions for Mark? Okay. Um, so very quickly, timelines as we discussed, Monday, January 4th, you need to have your proposal submitted. Um, we will have summaries that we will be sending to you on January 22nd. You can consider this your first reminder to update us the changes in your project if you haven't already notified us. Um, draft letters with investment and leverage will be available on February 1st. They will be sent to the developers. We're sending them to the contact name on the application. So if you want to see it, make sure your name is on the contact name on the application. Comments will be coming back to us by February 5th with the objective of having letters finalized by Monday, February 9th, which should be plenty of time to get the, the letters into your, into your uh, system so you can put them on your disk and send them to OFA. So, um, obviously, we are, you know, as we indicated, the idea of having this meeting is instead of having, you know, 50 different calls with people and possibly not having consistent messaging. This is an opportunity to provide consistent messaging. That does not mean that you cannot reach out to us. You know, we've identified the members of the team so that you know that you can contact us if you have things that do not fit in the box very well. We are happy to have discussions with you. We are happy to have WebEx meetings with you. We are happy to look at what your challenges are and see what we can do to assess 
Um, clearly, do not surprise us with something on January 4th that is really wonky, unless, you know, it's much better to have those discussions in advance. And, um, you know, our job is for you to be as successful as possible. We would be extremely happy if everybody that applied got funded. We do everything that we can to help you put a successful application forward. So I want you to know that we are really here for you. You don't have to ask your questions now. We will be sending these materials out. Um, happy to, to dialogue privately uh, at a later date if that is what you want. I thank you for your time and attention today. I think it's really helpful that everybody gets to hear the same message. I wish you all the best as you work on your applications. Like I said, we would be delighted if everybody got funded. We know that's not going to happen, but we still would be delighted to see that happen. So um, with that, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take those. Otherwise, we can call it a day. All righty then. Okay, so I think we're good to go. Thanks, Paul.